Again, thank you for being here. My name is Dan Keenan. I serve as Senior Vice President for Government and Community Relations with the Sisters of Providence Health System. Uh, and on behalf of our Board of Trustees and several of whom are with us today, including our Chair, John Schoberg, Sister Ruth McGoldrick, and John Joyce uh, and Bill Silvanic, we welcome you and thank you for being here to celebrate the opening of our transformed opioid recovery center. The opioid epidemic has touched us all, uh, but for many years, the uh, Providence Behavioral Health Hospital has been educating, preventing, and treating those who are addicted by opioids. And as discouraging as this opioid academic, epidemic has been, the past several years, attention on this has really been encouraging from a public policy perspective. Uh, that, that attention has really allowed us to bring together many groups, the providers, law enforcement, elected officials, and policymakers to have, try to have a more of an impact on trying to, ha uh, trying to treat those with, with addiction. Uh, we're very fortunate to have many people um, in, in the public world and elected officials who are working on public policy to have an in impact to allow us to do things like uh, re renovate this opioid treatment center. Um, I'd now like to ask Dr. Scott Wolf, our president of Sisters of Providence Health System, to come forward. I think many of you have met, met Dr. Wolf. He's been with the Sister Providence Health System for the past six years, but only the past couple months he's been serving as our president. Uh, he has been, led many transformation efforts over the past several years here, but he also has a, ma a master's in public health um, and really does have an appreciation for the impact that we can have on a system on the lives of people who live in our community. And the work that we do here really does have an impact on the lives of people who live in our community. Um, you know, when I thought about today's uh, gathering, it, it truly is bittersweet. Um, on the one hand, it, it's truly a celebration. It's a celebration of the opening of this expanded, uh, beautiful new resources uh, where our patients can come uh, and feel safe um, and, and receive the care uh, that they so dearly need uh, that's delivered by a team uh, who really and truly comes to work each and every day uh, and performs God's work in, in caring for them. Um, but on the same side, it, it's somewhat bitter and tragic that services and expansion of services like this are actually needed. Uh, it's tragic over the fact that, that on a daily basis we serve nearly 1,000 doses of methadone uh, to our needy patients in our community who are dealing with addictions, and yet that's not enough. And it's tragic that these patients that come to us day in and day out, in addition to bearing the, the, the weight of having this illness, uh, that this affliction, that they also carry a burden uh, of, of the, the characteristic that they're uh, attributed to, uh, the reputation that they have, uh, and that's an, an added burden that they have to bear. Um, you know, last week uh, I was at an event, I was fortunate uh, to be able to hear uh, our governor uh, give a presentation. Um, and don't quote me on this because I don't want to be, I don't want to misquote the governor. Um, but he told a, an incredibly moving story um, that, that truly moved me and I just want to share it because I really think uh, it has relevance today. Um, he told a story, I don't recall exactly where he was, but he was speaking uh, to a woman, uh, a mother in, the, in a community. And that mother went up to him and they were talking, as you know, the governor is passionate uh, about uh, the, the addiction uh, epidemic. And this mother walked up to him and was telling the story that she was talking to one of her neighbors uh, in, her, in her community. And this, this mother was talking about how one of her family members was afflicted with cancer and was pretty much on, on their dying bed. And that night, the neighborhood came together and that, that this particular individual was, was uh, presented with casseroles. Uh, to, to you know, help uh, uh, relieve the pain that she was feeling because of the potential loss of a loved one dealing with cancer. And yet this same mother was talking to the governor and said that she had a child afflicted with addiction uh, and every night would go to bed wondering if that was the last night that she was going to see her child come home unbeknownst where they may be in this world of addiction. And this mother went on to say, you know what, I didn't get a casserole. And so I, I was truly moved by that story, and I think that's why we're here today, and that's why we do what we do, because I think we have to make more casseroles for our patients. We have to uh, relieve the stigma and the negative stigma that these patients bear in, in the addition to their, the burden of this illness. And that's truly, I think, why we're here today and why we're celebrating uh, this expanded space and this expanded services 
And as tragic as it is, uh, as the Sisters of Providence have been doing for over 140 years, we are answering that call and bringing these services to the patients who need them most. So without further ado, I do want to introduce our next speaker, and Dr. Rob Roos, who really doesn't need an introduction. And I promise you, I'm not going to bore you with his resume, because I can go on for hours about the accomplishments that he has had uh, over the course of his career. Um, but I, I want to introduce him um, by, by referencing um, a, uh, a quote. Um, and it's one of my favorite quotes uh, by Sir William Osler, because I really think it depicts the type of physician that Dr. Roos is. And he went on to say that the practice of medicine is an art, not a trade. It's a calling and not a business. And a calling in which your heart will be exercised equally with your head. Often the best part of your work will have nothing to do with the potions or powders, but with the exercise of an influence of the strong upon the weak, the righteous upon the wicked, and the wise upon the foolish. And again, I think that really depicts the type of physician Dr. Rob Bruce is. Thank you. Thank you all for being here, even on this day. It uh, really is a privilege to do, to do what we do here. It really is a privilege to do what we do. Drug and alcohol use is the single greatest cause of preventable death in our country, the single greatest cause of early death. Opioid overdose death is the single greatest injury-related cause of death in our nation and in our state. More than 47,000 individuals die of an opiate overdose in the United States every year. More than 1,200 die in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. There's no mistaking it that we're amidst a crisis, and it is a tragic crisis in many ways. And this was announced in 2013 here in our own state and throughout the country, many states and national organizations followed. But in reality, this crisis was smoldering for years before this. And a lot of you in this room know that. In New England right now, I would still consider us, and we have been for several years, really the ground zero for devastation with opiate addiction. And I was surprised to learn that when I moved here in 2013 from the Bronx, which at one point could have been appropriately called the ground zero of addiction for many decades. And so this public health crisis has impacted too many individuals, too many families, and all of our cities and towns throughout the Commonwealth. It really has spared no one. We all know someone, or we know someone who knows somebody who's been impacted by opiate addiction or overdose. And so while the reality and the tragic nature of the crisis is true, with any crisis comes opportunity. And we can be emboldened and heartened by our opportunity to make an enormous impact. And so it's not only a privilege to do what we do here in this clinic every day, but it's a privilege for me to be with all of you in this together. We brought you here today, and we appreciate you coming here today as a small recognition and celebration of that fact. Each and every day, the staff of this program treats nearly 1,000 individuals with medication-assisted treatment, individuals that live in Holyoke and Springfield, the surrounding towns, from Pittsfield to Greenfield. And we have the privilege to witness individuals who are struggling with addiction, to be present with them in those offices and in those rooms to witness how that can impact their lives. But we also have the privilege to be able to deliver high quality, evidence-based, life-saving treatment. And the privilege to see individuals and families transform in front of your eyes over weeks to months. Because we intentionally brought this into this space today because it's not easy to walk through those doors right there every single day. Down that walkway. 365 days a year, including this morning, including tomorrow. It's not easy on the first day where you have to recognize that you've been struggling with an addiction and you're looking for help. It's not easier on the 30th day or the 300th day or the 30,000th day. So while addiction has long been described as a cunning and a baffling disease, let's not forget that there are several immutable truths, one of which is that no one ever wanted to develop an addiction. 
to the tens of thousands of individuals that I've treated over the last decade, there hasn't been one person who was born or woke up saying, I want to develop a problem with a substance or behavior so much that it spirals my life out of control, that I struggle to keep up with my daily responsibilities, my work, or my family. Not one. And so many of you, I recognize, many of you have never been inside an, inside an opioid treatment program or a methadone clinic. At some point in time, all of us may have held preconceived notions about methadone programs. They may have come from news stories from several decades ago or from popular culture or film or films that portray the darker side of addiction and its treatments. But I think part of what today's celebration is about is that we are really, I believe, and hopeful that we are in a different era of addiction medicine. That we are in a different area where we recognized that this truly is a health condition. Where addiction medicine is recognized as a specialty in the medical field. Where we know that there are evidence-based treatments that combine medication like methadone, buprenorphine, or naltrexone with behavioral and psychosocial and spiritual interventions like counseling, case management, and recovery-oriented groups and support that are essential to combating this disease. And that we recognize now, in this era, that that's where we need to focus our resources. Addiction is, after all, a biopsychosocial, spiritual disease, and it impacts all facets of society, and so our solutions must engage all aspects of society. And time and time again, it's been demonstrated that that medication-assisted treatment has the best outcomes. We've been using methadone since the 1960s in the United States, and it's been subject to intense scrutiny and undue stigma. But when it's utilized appropriately and integrated into a continuum of resources, it is without a shadow of a doubt the most effective treatment for opiate addiction that we have. It is effective in reducing drug use. It is effective in keeping people in treatment. It is effective in reducing crime. It is effective in increasing employment and it is most importantly effective in saving lives, reducing deaths from opiate overdose. So this space right here that we're all standing in is one of those places where people can access opiate addiction treatment, this multidisciplinary treatment. And when we set out a few years ago to redesign this space, and it might seem somewhat modest when you're here for the first time, we did so with the mission of the work that we do and the goal to improve the care for the individual seeking treatment and for the community at large. So in one way, you might say that what we did was we set out to make it just a little bit easier to walk through those doors every day. To make treatment here less institutional and more therapeutic. Because treatment's not a quick fix for any chronic disease. It is not a cure. It's a treatment that involves, at least initially, attending a daily focus and a daily program 365 days a year no holidays, no sick days, no break. And so it was with this in mind that we set out to make this reception area more welcoming. Our prior reception area entered right there, kitty corner to this office, in a dark, concrete-walled, no-windowed room that led patients down one hallway, down another hallway, down another hallway to access the nursing station for medication. So we set out to make this reception area more welcoming, more open, more therapeutic. And we designed the flow of patients to be more efficient. So when somebody enters, they can scan in at an electronic kiosk that informs them what responsibilities they have to attend to their treatment that day. Meet with and greet, be greeted by our receptionist. Move to receiving a drug test if necessary, and then exit to go towards the medication stations to receive their daily medication in a private, secure area before leaving. As well as wait in a space that's more comfortable when they have individual or group counseling. We set out to redesign our medication nursing station just across the hallway here to add an additional dosing station, a fourth <coughs> dosing station. And designed it with input from staff, our wonderful nurses, and our patients to make sure that they had a comfortable environment for the patients in a secure and private space to receive their medication. We also added some additional enhancements like lighted cues for our dosing stations so that you know when there's a station available. And we co-located 
our drug testing nurse assistant with access to our receptionist and their own private bathroom for the patients to use. With these enhancements to our facility and with similar enhancements to our clinical treatment and improvements, I believe that we've continued to do our part, continued to take some steps to make treatment both better and more accessible. Because our patients deserve the same high quality facilities to match our high, high, our high quality treatment as do the patients that are receiving treatment for any chronic disease like cancer, diabetes, or heart disease. And since then, we've seen some improvements. So we opened this space to our patients a few weeks ago, and we've already seen patient appreciation go up. We've seen security incidents, which Jay will be very happy about, go down. <laughs> we've seen a dramatic improvement in the single greatest indicator of patient satisfaction and a significant indicator of staff satisfaction the time it takes to get medicated. Because if you imagine coming to this clinic each and every single day of the year, and you want to attend to the rest of your responsibilities in life, like work, childcare, other appointments, other obligations, you need to make sure that this treatment is patient-oriented and efficient. And so in the, month, in the month of March, after opening and renovating this space, we saw our average time factoring all of our patients, more than 650 dosing at this site, essentially every single day. The average time from door to dosing and leaving at five minutes. Wow. Just like the registry motor vehicles. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could say the same thing, right? <laughs> and we've seen ourselves, our, our, our staff here and our patients surpass our goal of the, of the numbers of patients being medicated in less than 15 minutes. So that 97% of patients entering treatment were medica medicated in less than 15 minutes. So each day, it's a privilege to keep working on this. This morning, I, I see patients every morning. This morning I saw a patient who we admitted to treatment. So her first day being dosed with methadone after some time. Struggling with heroin addiction of up to a bundle a day after relapsing six months ago, after she unexpectedly had to leave methadone treatment. She's not necessarily somebody, if you conjured up your wildest stereotypes, would be walking through these doors. She has a college education, decades of work experience, a mother, a grandmother, dressed in a professional suit. But after discussing her treatment options, and after she thought about her treatment options, and her history of prior treatment in the past, and her history of successful recovery at various times, she knew this was exactly the place that she needed to be. She knew that this was exactly the type of treatment that she needed to start her on her road to recovery. And so after our interview and, I, and reviewing the risks and benefits to treatment, she stood up and very resolutely and politely said a few simple words. Thank you so much for saving my life, for allowing me to get back to my family, for allowing me to get back to my work, for allowing her and many others to not chase a substance, but to get back to normal. This treatment had worked for her before, just as it has for countless others, and it will continue to work for innumerable patients and families. <clears throat> we know in this fight that prevention is key in order to stem the tide of addiction for generations to come, but we also know well now that treatment <coughs> that involves medication and other supports does indeed work, and people can and do recover. And so on behalf of and because of our patients, which is why we're here, I want to say thank you to you all as well. To our senior leadership team for the investment to renovate this space, to our board of trustees, to our foundation board, to the Department of Public Health Bureau of Substance Abuse Services, to our supportive legislators and elected officials, we could not do this without you. To our district attorneys who are pushing progressive policies about how, how we deal with addiction in our communities. To our program friends like Learn to Cope and Allies. I know we are all in this together. The biggest and most important thank you, however, goes to our staff. Our staff of multidisciplinary, multidisciplines, from clinicians to nurses to nurse assistants to office staff, and to our leadership, who continue to make it possible 
to do the work that we do. Amidst construction, amidst a multitude of challenges, thank you. We have a number of our methadone treatment program leadership here today, and I'm going to introduce them if they can raise their hands as well. Because as we go around this space throughout the next rest of this hour, please seek them out to ask them about how this has impacted our patients and how this has impacted our staff. Jay Stabile, our program director. Mm -hmm. give her a clap. <laughs> Guy Ciancio, our assistant program director. Gwen Fenton, our nurse manager. Marsha Branch, clinic supervisor at Springfield Location. Betsy Sardella, clinic supervisor here at the Holyoke location. And Sarah Perez, our office coordinator for outpatient addiction services. So, so it really is a celebration for us. It's a privilege to do what we do, and it's a, a privilege to work on this issue with you all, because I know we're in this together. I encourage you all to walk around this space, to put yourselves in the shoes of somebody who's seeking treatment, because we want to continue, literally, breaking down some walls. Construction was fun after all. <laughs> we want to figuratively continue to break down barriers to building a continuum of excellence here to come. Thank you. I think you can all see why we feel very fortunate to have Dr. Roos leading our efforts at Sisters of Providence Health System, why the governor asked Dr. Roos to serve on his opiate work group, and why uh, patients with substance abuse issues in Western Massachusetts are fortunate that he's here. Thank you, Dr. Roos. Thank you for